Hi everyone, today I'll be guiding you through the principles of experimental research design. We are going to focus on key elements and concepts in this type of research. I hope you find this presentation helpful and informative. So, when we want to talk about experimental research design, we should note that it isn't just about scientists in white coats mixing chemicals. Experiments are the backbone of discovery across a spectrum of fields. In neuroscience, it helps us map the brain, revealing how we think and feel. In psychology, it uncovers the reasons behind our actions. It's not all just about the human experience, though. In physics and chemistry, experimental research has enabled us to explore the building blocks of the universe, understanding the principles that govern everything from the smallest atoms to largest galaxies. Beyond the natural sciences, this method shapes our world in a practical way. It leads to breakthrough in medicine, creating treatments that save lives. It drives innovation in chemistry, material science, engineering, and even influences policies through economics and social sciences. As we begin this presentation, remember that experimental research is more than just a method. It's a culture and pathway to systematic progress. Is how we advance, innovate, and evolve in mostly every aspect of our lives. Experimental research mirrors the everyday experiments we conduct without even realizing it. Taking cooking a new cuisine, for example. We mix ingredients with different scales, adjusting spices and temperatures, much like scientists adjust for variables to observe different outcomes, or when we are exploring a new genre of music. It's similar to exploring uncharted territories in research, seeking patterns and resonances that click with our personality and desires. So, let's now journey through the evolution of experimental research throughout the history. It all begins with 10th century polymath Alhazen from Basra modern, modern day Iraq. He's famed for his work on optics, particularly for explaining how vision works by light reflecting off objects and entering our eyes. Alhazen's groundbreaking method at the time was changing experimental condition, conditions systematically to observe different outcomes. This wasn't just innovative, it was birth of the scientific method. Fast forward to Renaissance, an era of curiosity and exploration, a down for thinkers and scientists, Leonardo da Vinci, with his detailed anatomical drawings based on dissections, showed us the human body as never before. The key here was how he carefully documented his findings. Galileo Galilei, with his telescope, not only discovered moons of Jupiter, but also championed the idea, of, the idea that the Earth revolved around the sun. Using meticulous observations and documentation to challenge and change our understanding of the universe. Then came the Enlightenment era, spotlighting thinkers like Sir Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes. Bacon, often called the father of empiricism, argued that knowledge is based on observable phenomena and experiments. Descartes, with his method of Doubt laid the groundwork for the scientific method by emphasizing systematic deduction and analytical thinking. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, experimental research broadened its scope, notably in chemistry and biology. Louis Pasteur, for whom the Pasteur quadrant is named, was a key figure who rigorously challenged the myth of the spontaneous generation advocating instead that fermentation and disease are caused by microorganisms, not inherent changes in other objects or people. Through his experiments, he not only showcased the role of microorganisms in fermentation and disease, but also introduced pasteurization and vaccines, transforming public health. Then there is Gregor Mendel, a reserved pasture, often pasture, often working quietly in his garden with peas, who laid the foundational stones of genetics. His careful crossbreeding experiments revealed the basic laws of inheritance, though his genius was recognized only decades later, proving how ahead of his time he truly was. The 20th century welcomed Ronald Fisher, 
who brought a revolution with his statistical methods, giving experimental research a new lens to view and analyze data. Fisher's work provided the tools to sift through the noise, find patterns, and draw more accurate conclusions from data collected in experiments. Fast forward to our time, the digital age, and we see experimental research utilizing the wave of technology. Computers, the internet, machine learning, and so on, have not just become tools but catalysts that propel research forward, enabling us to tackle complex analysis that were once beyond our reach. Today's science is characterized by a push for reproducibility and open science, where sharing findings and data openly has become the norm, promoting a culture of transparency and collaboration between researchers. But all in all, what, why experimental research design is so powerful? The potency of experimental research design lies in its ability to deliver dependable results, allowing researchers to do, draw accurate causal conclusion about the effectiveness of treatments or interventions. This control over variables ensures that outcomes are directly attributed to the manipulation of the independent variable, fortifying the credibility, credibility of the findings. Across disciplines such as Physics, chemistry, medical sciences, environmental sciences, neuroscience, and psychology, experimental research design serve as the main mostly used methodology. So, what is experimental research design? There are many definitions, but one definition is that experimental research design is a systematic approach where researchers manipulate one or more variables to determine their effect on one or more outcome variables. This method allows us to establish cause and effect relationship with high precision. Here, cause and effect is a key takeaway from experimental research design concept. Simply said, experimental research enables us to discover how different factors or variables affect outcomes to establish a causal relationship. Some key components of experimental research are independent variable, the variable that is manipulated by the researcher, dependent variable, the outcome or effect measured in the experiment, the variable that is dependent on the independent variable, control group, a group not exposed to the independent variable, used for comparison, as we'll explain it thoroughly later, experimental group, the group exposed to the independent variable. Let's use a psychology example to make this Clearer. Imagine researchers want to know how sleep affects our ability to think and solve problems. They decide to change or manipulate the amount of sleep people get. That's the independent variable. Some particip participants in the study get 8 hours sleep, like a normal night's sleep, while others only get 4, four hours of sleep manipulated. Next, they measure how well these people perform on a given cognitive task, like memory quizzes or puzzles. This performance is the dependent variable because it depends on how much sleep they got. To make sure the results are trustworthy, they divide participants into two groups. The control group, which gets the normal 8 hours of sleep, showing researchers how people typically perform. The experimental group, which is sleep deprived with only four hours of sleep, showing the effect of less sleep on thinking and problem solving. This setup allows researchers to see if the change in sleep really does affect cognitive performance. It's a powerful tool in psychology and other sciences because it uncovers the connections between what we do or experience and how it influences the outcomes. In experimental research, we categorize variables into three types. These types should not be confused with independent and dependent variables, as these aim at different inherent properties of variables, not research utilized concepts of independent and dependent variables. These categories are inherent to the properties of variable study. First one is stimulus variable that are elements that mold participants' reactions and interpretations. They encompass factors such as interface design, 
color schemes and shapes, all of which affect how individuals engage with stimuli. For the pur purpose of this presentation, I'm going to use examples related to design and psychology which, which would be more relatable to us. For instance, in a UX study examining website usability, researchers might manipulate the color scheme to see how it affects users and navigation behavior. You can see in the picture of examples that different stimulus variables such as user interface of an operating system, colors in an interior design, ergonomic shape of a knife, and design of a fighter jet's cockpit, all are stimulus variables. By altering these variables, researchers can uncover insights into human behavior and cognition. Stimulus variables serve as essential tools for understanding how external factors impact human responses. Behavioral variables are observable actions or responses exhibited by participants during experiments, offering insights into their interaction with the stimuli or environments. Examples include key presses, accuracy tests, and reaction times, or emotional changes, which reflect how participants respond to different stimuli. For instance, in a user interface study, Researchers might measure the time it takes for participants to navigate through menus or the number of errors made during a specific task. Analyzing these variables allows researchers to understand human behavior and assess the effectiveness of interventions or treatments they are developing. Finally, subject variables are inherent characteristics of participants. They play a significant role in shaping their responses in experiment. These variables constitute a range of factors including age, gender, height, weight, intelligence, or personality traits. By recognizing and accounting for these variables, researchers gain insight into how individual differences impact the study outcomes. Understanding influence of subject variables is crucial as it helps us for a, to achieve a more comprehensive interpretation of results and a deeper understanding. Another key element of, of the experimental research design is sampling. Choosing a sample strategy in research is a must because it ensures that our study findings accurately represent the larger population we are interested in and fortifies the reliability and validity of these findings. For instance, if we're studying sports performance, we want to make sure our sample includes athletes from diverse char characteristics like age, gender, skill level, and training background. This diversity helps us draw conclusions that help to broaden the range of athletes and the generaliz ger generalization of our results. There are many sampling techniques, but here we focus on four highly used techniques in, in experimental research design. First one is simple random sampling that involves selecting individuals from population at random, providing each member with an equal chance being included. This method effectively, effectively minimizes bias and ensures that the sample accurately reflects the population in general. However, it can be impractical for very large, broad, large population due to the need for comprehensive list of all members. A stratified sampling divides the population into subgroups based on specific characteristics, with random samples drawn from each stratum to ensure representation across all demographic groups. It guarantees representation from all segments enhancing the accuracy of results. A downside to, to this method is that it's very complex and it might be hard to organize large population into relevant strata bef before sampling. Convenience sampling selects individuals who are readily available or easily accessible, potentially introducing bias and limiting the generalizability of results but catalyzes the testing and data collection phase. 
a study investigating the effects of background noise on problem solvability, researchers might set up a booth in a university library and invite passing students to participate. This approach is quick and easy but might not represent all demographic equality. Snowball sampling begins with a small group of participants who are deliberately targeted, who then refer others to participate, often utilized for hard to reach populations or individuals with specific characteristics. However, it risks sample bias since the selection is not random and relies on the network of individual participants. Consider a study on drug abuse. The researchers start with a few known cases and ask them to refer others they know with the same condition, gradually building a large sample. Each of these techniques serve as a unique purpose in experimental research. It allows researchers to effectively sample populations while minimizing potential biases. In experiments, variance plays a crucial role in understanding the reliability of our findings. Variance quantifies the spread or dispersion of data points from the mean. It indicates the degree of variability within the data or our conclusion. The main function of the experimental research design is to control variance. We have three types of variances. Experimental variance. This type of variance relates to the differences in outcomes that are directly linked to changes in the independent var variable. For example, in a study examining the effects of a different teaching methods on student performance, the experimental variance would be the variation in test scores associated with teaching methods being tested. Extraneous variance or confounding factors involves factors beyond the independent variables that in the independent variables that could affect the dependent variables and therefore the results of the study. Imagine a study investigating the impact of sleep on memory retention, but participants' caffeine intake before the experiment also influences their performance. The variation in memory retention caused by caffeine consumption would contribute to extraneous variance, as it's a third factor not related to the subject of this study. It is extraneous from the main subject of our study. Error variance, also known as random error, accounts for the variability in outcomes that cannot be attributed to either independent variable or extraneous factors. It represents the noise in the data that arises from chance fluctuations or measurement errors. For instance, in a reaction time task, random factors like momentary distractions or inconsistencies in measurement equipment can contribute to error variance. A good research design will maximize the experimental variance and control the extraneous variance while minimizing error variance. In this way, we can draw more accurate conclusions and contribute to our collective understanding of the phenomenon. But how can we do this? How can we control the variance the way we want? Experimental variance simply means how much influence does A have on B, achieving maximized experimental variance in research involves balancing high accuracy and precision to ensure that observed differences are meaningful and contributes significantly to our understanding of the variables under investigation. Here, accuracy refers to the closeness of measured values to target value, while precision refers to the consistency or reproducibility of those measurements. For example, in a study investigating the effect of different teaching methods on student performance, in mathematics, researchers may introduce variations in teaching strategies across different classrooms. One classroom might focus on traditional lecture-based instruction, while another implementation has interactive problem-solving approach. 
by carefully controlling other factors such as student demographics, which will know it's, ex it's an extraneous factor, and other factors, researchers can isolate the impact of teaching methods on its student outcomes. Simply, they can make a clear relationship on how much A has influence on B. Controlling extraneous variables is important for maintaining the integrity of research findings. Strategies for controlling the extraneous variables are elimination, where researchers remove the extraneous variable entirely from the study, such as only recruiting participants from specific expertise level, such as only architects. Randomization involves varying the presentation or order of conditions within participants, minimizing sequence effects akin to random sampling, but randomization of variations. Inclusion includes incorporating the extraneous variable as a factor in the study design, such as comparing dependent variables between gender to account for gender-related factors. And lastly, minimizing error variance involves reducing errors of measurement through controlled conditions, again increasing the reliability of research measures. This is achieved by implementing scientifically developed scales and randomizing condition placement by, for example, gender, which helps to minimize measurement errors and ensure that the accuracy and consistency of data. In experimental research design, two main approaches are used more consistently, but we should note that there are more. First one is true experimental design. True experimental design involves randomly assigning participants to groups. This random assignment of participants to groups is a specific procedure to ensure each participant has an equal chance of being placed in any group, directly controlling for biases and establishing causality. This is distinct from random sampling, which is we talked about, which is about how participants are selected from a larger population to participate participate in study, aiming for representativeness. Random assignment deals with how these selected participants are then allocated to different groups within the experiment. This randomization ensures fairness and minimizes bias. For example, a researcher might employ true experimental design to study the impact of natural lighting on, produ pro on productivity in office spaces. Participants would be randomly assigned to, assigned to work in either naturally lit or artificially lit office spaces. By controlling for factors like workspace layout, furniture design, and ambient noise, the researchers can confidently attribute any differences in productivity between two groups to the, manipul two groups to the manipulation of the independent variables, that is, lighting conditions. In Contrast to true experimental design, quasi-experimental design does not involve random assignment of participants to groups. This approach is commonly adopted when true randomization is impractical or ethically challenging. While quasi-experimental design provides some control over variables, it may be vulnerable to confounding factors, reducing its effectiveness in establishing causality compared to true experimental design. Let's make an example. Imagine in environmental psychology, a researcher might want to employ quasi-experimental design when investigating the impact of urban green spaces on mental, well mental health and well-being. Since it's, since it's impractical, and unethical to randomly assign individuals to actually live in these areas or impact their well-being, quasi-experimental design becomes necessary. Instead, the researcher might compare the mental health outcome of individuals already living near existing green areas with those residing in urban areas lacking such amenities. While quasi experimental research design 
allows for some degree of control, factors like individual lifestyle choices, choices or pre-existing mental health conditions may confound the results, making it challenging to establish a causal relationship with competence. As subjects participate in an experiment, researchers have the option to collect the data in two ways, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative data includes measurable factors, numerical or abstract sim symbols that show time elapsed, uh, temperature change, mood changes, oxygen intake change, and distances covered, and so on. By quantifying the impact of independent variable on dependent variable, researchers can systematically measure changes or differences. In a study examining the effect of sleep deprivation on cognitive performance, researchers might measure participants' reaction times to specific stimulus or event performing a cognitive task, leading to a quantifiable insight into the influence of sleep loss on cognitive functions. Qualitative data, on the other hand, is non-numerical and focuses on capturing the quality of phenomena. This includes observational notes detailing behavior or environment, transcripts from interviews offering personal insights and responses from open-ended surveys. This type of data delves deeper into the experimental outcome, offer insights into participants' experiences motivations, or perspectives. It often complements quantitative data by providing context and explanation to numerical findings. In the same study I mentioned, research researchers might collect participants' feedback on their subjective experience of fatigue to open-ended questions, allowing for a context-rich understanding of the impact of sleep deprivation on individual well-being. Now, these different types of data could be collected utilizing various types of methods. Laboratory experiments that take that which take place within controlled environments. Field experiments that unfold in natural setting. Surveys and questionnaires serve as a valuable tool for gathering contextual information about the participants. Observations entail direct witnessing of participants' reaction and behaviors. And finally, physiological measures involve the use of equipment to monitor bodily responses, providing objective data in fields like psychology, neuroscience, and health sciences. In experimental research, analyzing data is a critical step in drawing meaningful conclusions from collected information. Firstly, researchers mathematically summarize the data by calculating averages, identifying common outcomes, and determining the statistical spread of the data, measuring accuracy and precision of the findings. Next, they compare the results between different groups, such as the control group and experimental group, to assess the effectiveness of interventions and treatments. Looking for patterns in the data is another important aspect of analysis. Researchers employ various statistical, statistical methods, including machine learning algorithms, to uncover underlying trends and relationship between variables. Lastly, scientists meticulously check the details to ensure that any observed differences are statistically significant and not merely due to the chance. This involves employing statistical tests like t-tests or ANOVA to validate the reliability of their findings, providing confidence in the conclusions drawn from the data. In an experiment testing reaction time for electric cars, suppose scientists are measuring how quickly drivers press the brake in response to a specific signal. If the data shows a difference in reaction times of just one millisecond between groups, a statistical test like t-test or ANOVA are used to determine if this difference is significant. In this case, in this case, this difference is not significant, meaning the observed variation could be due to chance rather than the experimental condition.
conditions. Those thus another thus not providing a reliable basis for drawing meaningful conclusions. There are different standards that validify the uh, quality of uh, experimental research. First one is validity, which is crucial for accurate measure. Two main types of validity are internal validity, which ensures that changes in the dependent variable are truly caused by manipulating the independent variable and not by external factors. For instance, in a study on the effects of a new teaching method on student performance, internal validity would ensure that any improvement seen in test scores is indeed due to the teaching method and not influenced by other factors or variants, like time of the day or motivation. External validity, though, ensures that findings can be generalized beyond the specific conditions of the study or to other settings, populations, or times. For example, if a study finds that a particular medication is effective in reducing symptoms of a disease in a specific demographic group, external validity would consider whether the same result could be achieved with other demographics or in, or in other regions. Achieving both internal and external validity in research involving specifically humans could present a tricky balance. Researchers must navigate these balances carefully because aiming because they have to aim to enhance one an aspect, not over the expense of the other as aspect. For example, tightly controlling variables to max maximize internal validity may result in artificial conditions that limit the generalizability of the findings to real world. Compromising external validity or conversely prioritizing, prioritizing the realism of study conditions to enhance external validity may introduce confounding variables that undermine, undermine internal validity. One of the most important quality standards for experimental research design is reliability. Reliability ensures consistency in results. A reliable experiments can be repeated under the same conditions and yield similar outcomes each time. For instance, if a scale consistently measures weight accu accurately when used multiple times, it is considered reliable. Reliability builds trust in scientific findings by demonstrating the consistency of data collected. We should note that reliability alone does not guarantee validity. Let's make an example. If a scale consistently measures weight but consistently underestimates it, it lacks validity despite it's reliable. In essence, while reliability ensures consistency, Validity ensures accuracy and relevance to the research question of both. On the other hand, reproducibility indicates that other scientists can replicate the experiment and arrive at the same conclusion as you got. It goes beyond consistency with a single study within a single study and verifies the robustness of the finding across different settings or different with conducted by different researchers. In experimental research, ethical standards ensure the well-being of participants and the integrity of the scientific process. This means that research extends beyond data collection to, to include participants' rights and well-being. Informed consents, briefing, and participants' consent and minimizing harm are imperative in these considerations. Additionally, researchers must safeguard participants' confidentiality, protecting their privacy and preventing potential abuse of data. A classic example from the history of psychology that underscores the importance of ethical standards is the Little Albert experiment conducted by John B. Watson in 1920. This experiment aimed to demonstrate classical conditioning by conditioning a fear response in an infant known as Little Albert. In the experiment, Little Albert was exposed to 
a white rat which he initially showed no fear towards. However, whenever little Albert reached out to touch the rat, researchers would make a loud noise behind him by striking a steel bar with a hammer continuously. Over the time, little Albert, poor, poor little Ar Albert, developed a fear of the rat and other similar simile, such as an artificial white fur coat, indicating that acquisition, acquisition of conditioned fear response has happened. Finally, before findings are published, expert viewers meticulously evaluate the study's methodology, analysis, and conclusions to ensure all the aforementioned standards are present. If a study claims to have found a significant relationship between social media use and negative mental health outcomes, peer reviewers would scrutinize the research methods to confirm the reliability of the findings. Through ethical oversight and peer review, experimental research maintains high standards of quality and credibility. Now, I would like to show you two recent studies that utilize experimental research in the field of design. In a neuroarchitectural study, researchers utilize EEG, VR, and machine learning to objectively assess the impact of office space design on motivation levels. I should mention that overall VR has significantly, significantly catalyzed the experimental research in the field of design. In this study, participants explored virtual offices while EEG monitored their brain activity, analyzing data for motivation-related patterns. The methodology involved pre-processing EEG data to remove noise, then classifying it using machine learning, achieving around 85% of accuracy in distinguishing between motivating and demotivating designs. Architectural features studied include color coding, texture of surfaces, space layout and the logical sequence of spaces or partly space syntax. The independent variable was the architectural design features and the dependent variable was the EEG data reflecting participants motivational states. This study focused on stimulus type of variables as they manipulated architectural elements within virtual environments to observe their impact on participants motivation. They also util utilize a touch of behavioral variables, which are space lay layouts that manifest specific behaviors. The experimental variance was the variation in EEG responses attributed to the different architectural design. They aim to control extraneous variance by standardize standardizing the virtual environment experience for all participants ensuring that any observed changes in motivation were due to architectural designs themselves. Error variance here would be unexplained variation in EEG data not accounted for by the experimental design, or simply noise. They used machine learning al algorithm to minimize the noise and clear the data. Another interesting study investigates the impact of user and system initiated personalization on the user experience at large sports events through a lab experiment with both qualitative and quantitative types of data collected. This paper explores how spectators interact with personalized content on mobile devices and assesses their preferences between control over personalization and automated system suggestions. Here, user-initiated personalization referred to scenario where users active, actively customize their experience by selecting preferences or content shown to them. System-initiated personalization, on the other hand, involves the system automatically tailoring the experience based on inferred user preferences, preferences or behaviors without the user's direct input. The independent variable in this study is the type of content presentation, specifically system-initiated person personalization, 
user initiated person aggression and the control condition on the other hand dependent variable is the user experience measured in relation to different constructs using scales outside in this study this study specifically focuses on analyzing the impact of these different content presentation methods on the components of user experience at large sport events in terms of variables this study involves stimulus variable related to type of content presented as well as behavioral variables related to user experience constructs this study controlled for several types of variances including experimental confounding and error experimental variances are managed by conducting the study as a laboratory experiment confounding variants are at risk by recruiting participants within a similar level of attendance at large sport events to avoid different preconceptions uh, to the experiment. This study also employs the use of visually challenging environment for spectators as part of experimental setup to control for potential confounding factors. Error variants are considered through the use of data analysis techniques such as non-parametric tests and affinity diagrams for analyzing observational, verbal, and interview data demonstrating comprehensive approach in managing variances in this study. At last, I would like to talk about my research and how I can explore my research through the lens of experimental research design. My research explores how VR simulated space-based objects impact immersion levels in individuals with design backgrounds, specifically targeting architecture students at NCSU. Employing a true experimental research design, the methodology involves VR simulation combined with EEG data tracking. This setup assesses immersion changes quantitatively and qualitatively when objects are removed from the virtual space. Participants are conveniently sampled from undergraduates and graduate architecture students aiming to control the extraneous variance. The independent variable is the specific object presence or absence in VR simulation, while the dependent variable is the immersion level through EEG and visual recollection test. Reliability is maintained through consistent VR and EEG applica application with validity assured by accur accurate measurement of VR immersion relative to object manipulation. The study's design ensures replicability given the clear definition of variables and accessibility of VR and EEG technologies to researchers. Thank you for bear with me today. I hope it was informative to you. See you in the class.